so many of you. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. And I am truly honored to have this opportunity to read you for a little bit. All right, Steve, let's do this. <clears throat> On July 11th, 2010, a series of explosions erupted across Kampala, Uganda. Terrorist attacks orchestrated by a wayward militant group looking to raise a little hell. One bomb gutted a popular restaurant while another tore across a rugby field where the men's FIFA World Cup championship match was being shown. I'm here to tell you the story of how these bombs led me to nearly all of the US national parks. You see, 76 innocent people were murdered that evening. One of them was Nate Hen, the Mzungu, the white man now with shrapnel on his chest. He was my best friend. Four days later, I moved to Estes Park, Colorado to start working at a wedding chateau just outside Rocky Mountain National Park. I arrived as an infected wound, helpless to any form of healing, with my days so filled with rage I couldn't see straight, my nights so filled with loss I couldn't sleep right. Thoughts became cancerous. I was an Estes, but I wasn't. Nights planned with friends to go bowling or see a movie were eclipsed by solitude at the river or unaccompanied drives into the woods. It was that, it was that or whiskey, cigarettes, and silence. I would drink till I puked, and then I would drink some more. I just couldn't shake this strange new paradigm of darkness forced upon me and illuminating that age-old truth that life is only possible with loss and loss only meaningful through love. But this loss was hardly warranted, with my heart not breaking, but bearing, and bearing, and bearing, and bearing. I didn't want to believe it. I just wanted my friend back. But the more I withdrew, the more I explored. I began reading extensive books on the National Park Service. I began going for hikes every free moment I had. And it was the mountains that drew me back in and offered me the fundamental truths that I needed. Because the more I learned about nature, the more I learned about myself. It was exploring Rocky Mountain National Park that breathed this new life back into me. To prove this, I wanted to hike Long's Peak, the highest point in the park, 14,259 feet, the keeper of the Rocky Crown. I'd been told the hike was going to be dangerous, that people died on that mountain every year. In fact, a man had just fallen to his death weeks earlier, but I went anyway. Because if I could get over that mountain, maybe, just maybe, I could get over my loss. Because I wanted to believe that solace is a wild thing best fostered in a forest, that many tormented men, all coming before me, had found refuge just the same. My trek, therefore, became internal struggle made tangible, a high altitude hike, exchanging mental torment for the palpability of physical pain. I wanted to sweat my sufferings. I wanted to seep all haunting memory from my mind. So I went where people die, hoping to feel alive, only to face my own trials. I took a wrong turn, nearly fell off a cliff, and confronted a mountain lion. This is all to say, I didn't make it to the summit. I went home defeated, shaken by my own scares, and was now hoping there would be another time and place for longs, maybe when my heart, like the mountain, was more willing to forgive. Out of all this came a very different goal, however, to visit every US national park, because something was still missing, and I needed to go further afield to find it, to move from the micro to the macro. To test this new resolve, I made a five-hour drive to Great Sand Dunes National Park. It was equally as stunning as Rocky Mountain National Park, yet unique in its own geological splendor. I needed to see more. So that fall, I moved to California and planned a new adventure for every weekend, filling my car with anyone curious enough to accompany me to the Redwoods, Sequoia, Lassen Volcanic, Death Valley. The rougher the better, the grittier the better because I was chasing new experiences and letting the physical manifestation of pain and hurt and anger and dissidence transubstantiate into the tangible act of travel. 
This was me skinny dipping on the Channel Islands or reaching the base of the Grand Canyon at midnight using only the vibrant light of the circling supermoon or having sex in the back of my car at a Kings Canyon campground. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> on business trips, I'd find any excuse to detour, Zion, Arches, Capitol Reef, Crater Lake. I started learning that life moves in seasons and that patterns are replete in the soil, in the stars, in ourselves. That it's the unknown complexities that make this life so simple, that the middle of nowhere is always the beginning of somewhere. That humans, despite what I've been shown, are inherently good. I learned to say yes to every odd opportunity that came my way, to keep goals like promises, how to be alone, but most importantly, I learned how to give people a chance, how to invite others on this journey with me. The parks kept coming, but so did the deaths. There was Carl's Bad Caverns, but there was also John mixing a lethal dose of chemicals together while locked inside his Jeep Liberty. There was Guadalupe Mountains, but also Shane drowning in a bridge jumping accident. Big Bend and Janice contracting Hantavirus. Dry Tortugas and Terry putting a gun to his head and pulling the trigger. All the while, I kept perpetual motion, still haunted, still searching, and silently hiking across this nation as well as others through the back country of my own curiosity and consciousness, writing and rewriting in my head the rough draft to all of my damage, a field guide to losing my friends. Four years later, on July 25th, 2014, and after visiting nearly all 59 of the U.S. national parks, I returned to Long's Peak. It was time to place the capstone on a half decade of hurt, to give a four-year curse back to the heavens, to say, I will forever miss the way that you smiled, that I'll always love you, and goodbye. And guess what? I did it. I made it to the top. Thanks.